I would like to welcome our great presenters today. So um, Professor Bob Sutton and Professor Huggy Rao. So Bob and Huggy's research at Stanford is really focused on organizational behavior and management. And they've co-authored um, Scaling Up Excellence, Getting to More Without Settling for Less, which was published back in 2014. Um, Scaling, Excellence, uh, Scaling Up Excellence is Wall Street Journal and Publishers Weekly bestseller and was selected as one of the best business books of the year by Amazon, the Financial Times, the Globe and Mail, and the Library Journal. So it's a pleasure to have, um, you know, Bob and Huggy, for, for, to have you both here with us today. And, you know, I'll hand it off to the real stars of the show. All right. Thank you so very much, uh, Mona. Uh, let me echo Mona's welcome to all of you. Welcome to Stanford. We deeply appreciate the fact that you're giving us your time uh, we realize it's our privilege to serve you and be of help to you. To say that we live in trying times, of course, is an understatement. COVID-19 has caused wrenching rearrangements of our life, both personal, professional, and social. But as all of us know, crises have two dimensions. On the one hand, they're a threat, and on the other, they're an opportunity. I'm actually very much looking forward to a conversation with my great friend, co-author, collaborator, co-wine drinker, Bob Sutton. Bob's actually been studying leadership for a very long time, actually about 30 plus years since he first started studying organizational decline in the Detroit area, or at least in the context of the automobile industry. So what we're going to do is we're going to riff on a couple of questions and then throw it open really for your questions so that we can all have a conversation. So Bob, let me take you to your wonderful good boss, bad boss. And you devoted a chapter to the idea that the best bosses don't shirk dirty work. What did you mean by that? Well, I, this is always true, but it's especially true in terms of the COVID madness. Uh, there's all those great things that bosses get to do, like, uh, I don't know, make announcements when people win prizes and grants and successes and good earnings and all those wonderful things they get to do. But uh, the path to get there, even during the best of times as well, uh, when people have performance problems and these days when layoffs are unfortunately going to be necessary for some of your organizations, takes and so on. Um, if, you, if you look at what uh, bad leaders do, they tend to put it off as long as possible. They tend to um, pass that work off to others rather than, than to be responsible and accountable. But if you look at what great uh, bosses do, uh, Harry Truman had it right when you know he said, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. <laughs> so, so this, so, and we're at a time when I see what, what, uh, what great bosses are doing, they're, they're making the decisions, they're implementing it, and they're being present for their people. So, uh, and, and, I'm, and I'm not telling anything that surprises anybody who is out there right now, that uh, every leader I know, the ones that stand, uh, that we know so well, we know how their, our deans are spending their days, uh, the, the leaders of every corporation, they're trying to figure out how to navigate through this really difficult mess. And that means making some tough decisions. And some of them are gonna be wrong, but they've gotta make them and they've gotta implement them. Okay. So that's kind, of the, that's kind of the first point. That's the that's wonderful. Might I actually take you for a moment to Guam, where the USS Roosevelt is currently anchored? Uh, you know, can you share with our viewers as to, uh, you know, whether what happened there was an example uh, of great leadership or the lack of uh, it? Can you unpack well, that for well, us? Well, it certainly was. If if the purpose of a great leader is to serve as a human shield. And to, and to protect the well-being, the mental health, the physical and health of leaders, certainly Captain Crozier did it. But when our, I guess our, our now former acting Secretary of Navy, isn't that what that dude's job was? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that going and yelling at scared people is just not a great idea. So that's, so we're sort of to what, onto, you know, what, one of the key messages. And I think, again, every leader out there knows it, knows this, doing it is another thing. There's, there's a different,
I think we might have lost you briefly, Bob. So what to me, there is an argument, see, even from the fired uh, acting secretary of the Navy, that he was fired in the wrong way. You don't yell at people. You don't insult them. You don't do it in, in a process that's unfair. And another example, which, which I just sort of love and hate it, because um, if you are a leader and you need to do layoffs or pay cuts, we have a perfect example of how not to do it. Just in the last couple of weeks, the CEO of Bird, the scooter company, and, and if you haven't seen this story, honestly, I'm not lying. What he did was, apparently it was his executive assistant, is that there was um, a, a webinar on Zoom like this, two minutes long. The only thing on the, the slide was no human being. It was COVID-19. Uh, essentially, 400 people were told you're losing your jobs now. And in those two minutes, they lost uh, their email and their Slack channel, and boom, they were gone. And people who missed the two-minute meeting they couldn't figure out why they why they uh, had no ability to uh, communicate with the company at all. So so that sort of brings me to kind of the key message of what's going on right now. So many of you leaders out there, um, whether you have one employee or a hundred thousand, uh, you're going to have to do some really tough things. And uh, this is something that um, my friend Michael Deering, an experienced executive, said to me years ago. But there's a difference between what you do and how you do it. So that's mostly what we're going to talk about throughout uh, throughout our uh, 45 minutes or so together. Right. So I, I, I love the way you contrasted both uh, what happened at Bird, the scooter company, and the and what unspooled, of course, at the USS Theodore uh, Roosevelt. Now, part of what you what I heard you sort of say is, in tough times, you've got to do the dirty work. But I'm yeah. wondering. Are there principles that can actually guide a leader in doing this <laughs> tough work, and what might they be? Uh, Huggy, you're being so mature. So, so it's pretty <laughs> funny just to give the leader a little back. So he's kind of being like the adult Huggy. I hardly ever get to see this. He's controlling himself <laughs> for a full ten minutes. He won't be able to keep it up. I promise you. But keep trying, Huggy. We'll see how well we can do. I'll do my very best. So, uh, so, so as Huggy said. So here's the the principles. Uh, some of the key principles, and Huggy had me put the dog up because because uh, there's this notion that that this book, Good Boss, Bad Boss, where some of the stuff comes from, we almost called that book Top Dog on a Tightrope because it's such a balancing act. Being a senior leader, there's so many different forces buffeting you, so that's where the dog comes from. So just to give you a little background, as Huggy said, um, I did my dissertation on organizational death, the process by which organizations um, are closed and should be closed, including, I, I think I did the only organ, only paper on organizational funerals with a guy named Stan Harris. And I attended these sort of wakes for organizations. And, um, and then I did a lot of research on organizational decline, layoffs and the like afterwards. And, and as part of that, I was working with my late and great dissertation advisor, Robert L. Kahn. He just died at 100 years of, of age last year, remarkable human being. Um, and we were looking to see, so what are the hallmarks based on what we see in organizations and what we see in the behavioral science literature of, um, of, of leaders who are great at essentially uh, making tough decisions, implementing them, and communicating them? So these are the four principles. They're pretty obvious, but, but uh, I think if you go back to them, they help. So let's start with the last one because that's kind of the most emotional part which is that if you as a leader don't express human compassion and in your behavior enact human compassion, you are in trouble and people will see through you. And there's all sorts of research. You look at uh, research um, by Gallup. Gallup's been studying, uh, well, for 30, 40 years, what are, what are the kind of leaders that motivate us versus alienate us? And uh, there's a more recent research from Google. And essentially, if a boss doesn't care about you as a human being, um, it makes you afraid, and it also makes you less willing to commit and do good things for the organization. So that's sort of the first one. So, Huggy, you got any comments on compassion? That's yeah. something that you're, you're great on. It, well, thank you, Bob. You know, as you were describing compassion, uh, I was kind of wondering, uh, from a leader's point of view, on the one hand, uh, how do you sort of balance, as it were, feelings of personal vulnerability, but at the same time projecting confidence? Can you talk to us a little bit about that tension, uh, please? Well, to me, 
there's I think there's a difference between uh, personal vulnerability, which was to me a sort of insecurity. I'm out of control. I don't know what's happening. Um, and, and, and also, uh, that's one of the classic things is, is when you have leaders who lash out at people personally and blame others, then that, then that's that's not the kind of vulnerability you want. But I think the kind of vulnerability is uh, this is painful for all of you. All of you, this is painful for us. We understand the effect that this is having on your family. I mean, for those of us who are all home right now, that's another sort of transition. I, I, I think that leaders who show a lot of empathy and express um, the kind of um, pain and difficulty and alienation we're all feeling, instead of just saying everything's just fine, and then say, let's stay together and do the best that we can. So, so to me, there's a difference between um, weakness and, and sort of raw fear and incompetence and having a realistic assessment of the situation, but let's move forward and, and do the best we can together. Yeah, I, I like the way you sort of described it. Uh, what helped me as you were describing this, Bob, was in moments of crises, if employees, colleagues, and the others are in a room called fear, of course, the job of the leader is to take them to a room called hope. And what I yes. heard you say very nicely was compassion is the passageway. You can't get from yeah. one room to another without compassion. I mean, is that a reasonable inference? Yes, in yes. And, 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 and the feeling that they actually um, care for me. I think that's right. the same thing. Right. So, so let's talk a little bit about some of the more objective principles. And this, this is something in years of studying, everything from plant closings to layoffs to pay cuts, uh, there's, there's all sorts of academic literature that suggests that um, if you're going to have to do this stuff, and God knows, just look at the unemployment data that came out today. There's a lot of bosses out there who are having to make these wrenching decisions. There's some things you can sort of keep in mind to at least ease the pain, both for the affected people, say that people are laid off in your organization, and those who survive. The first one is to give people as much predictability as possible. And and there's massive uncertainty out there. We can't always give people predictability, but I'll kind of give you an, an example. Is at least you can give them some predictability that they're going to be safe for a while. And, and where this comes from, there was some research done by uh, um, Seligman, a famous psychologist at Wharton. And he sort of looked to see what happened during the Blitzkrieg, during uh, World War II in London. And it was sort of interesting because during London, what happened was one of the reasons that it was not as disruptive, the bombing that the Germans did constantly, as it might have been to London, was they had excellent radar and, um, and uh, sirens to warn people the bombers were coming. So people could go about their business, and when they heard the sirens, they could go in the, and then they could go into the tube and, and air raid shelters. So they call it the signal safety hypothesis. And what good leaders... Um, uh, do and you can see this in the way that the good versus the bad ones handle layoffs is they try to create periods of safety and just in our own university i mean i think it was just the day before yesterday we got an email from um our provost persis Drell, and our head of hr and it said and god knows i'm pretty sure there's going to be, be layoffs coming in stanford but it said to all full-time stanford employees um your pay and your job is safe through june 15th and like that's not great after June 15th, but it's better than waking up every morning and wondering whether I'm going to be fired today. So that's kind of the first principle. Oh, and there's something else that I, especially at a time of fear and uncertainty, that we learned from our, our collaborator and friend, John Lilly. Uh, so there are some of you out there who are leading organizations where, thank goodness, I mean, I mean, if you're in the delivery business or if you're working at Zoom or something, like there's all sorts of job security. And you would think that when people are are in a, in, in a company where there's no layoffs and, 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 and uh, executives will just sort of assume this, oh, well, they know their jobs are safe. Well, when all their friends are losing their jobs, this, and this happened with John Lilly when he was CEO of a company called Mozilla um, and it was growing like crazy, well, his employees would still be afraid that they were going to be laid off. So to give them some predictability and safety, he kept having to assure them over and over again, no, we're actually hiring. And he said he had to say it over and over again before they actually believed him. So that's another side of the predictability coin, that even the people who you think have predictable, safe jobs, you have to tell them over and over again because there's so much fear out there. You know, when you talk about, I, I love the idea of giving employees predictability. But if I can shift the lens briefly onto the leader, 
Uh-huh. On the one hand, people want leaders to expect the unexpected. And huh. you and I know that in studies of crises, the first cues that arrive, they're noisy. You have to wait for the other cues to come. So can you talk to us a little bit about how crises drive up adrenaline? You want to pull the trigger, you want to make a decision, but you also need reflection. You need to listen oh. to others. Can you walk us through that uh, well, tension that's, as well? well? This, this is something I think you know more about than I do, Huggy. But, but this notion that essentially, in, there's all sorts of research on group dynamics and human behavior that your first instinct is probably wrong. Uh-huh. I mean, I, I, you, you and I both know this. And, 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 and essentially, at that point, and, you know, one of the expressions is we have this in our book somewhere, which we stole from Danny Kahneman, sometimes the best is, advice is don't do something, just stand there. Because you kind of got to figure out what's, what's going on. You got to assess the situation, wait for information to unfold. And in that situation, and I think it's a combination of predictability and we're kind of moving into understanding exactly. um, what you what, what you say to people is uh, the facts aren't clear now. Um, um, but what we're going to do is we're going to make no decisions for a week um, or we're going to stay in a steady state in a week and then we will get back to you. And, mm-hmm. and, and that idea of communicating to folks that we're dealing with the uncertainty, but we're trying to kind of time bracket it might be the best thing you can do. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and in general, the understanding thing to go on, this is just an example, is there's all sorts of research, uh, including some great stuff on pay cuts and plant closings, that when you that, that leaders who take the time to explain why decisions have been made, the transparency and underlying logic, not too complicated because people have a hard time processing it because there's so much under stress, that that actually helps blunt the blow as opposed to just looking at it's just something they just pulled out of their hat. So that's another mm-hmm. thing that, that is a hallmark of that people who implement uh, painful decisions do. Mm-hmm. So compassion, predictability, understanding. And, and control. So, so when it comes to how people do things, uh, how people experience the process of something like being laid mm-hmm. off, uh, some of us being sent home, uh, having a pay cut, there's all sorts of research that shows that although you might not be able to control what happens, to the extent you can give people some control over, um, for example, whether or not they have a little party to go and say goodbye to people, whether they can go in and clean out their desk, any sort of feeling that they have some influence over the way that the process unfolds and they just aren't sort of hapless victims, then that's one of those things that reduces the stress. And there's all sorts of research that shows that that um, even when people face just an overwhelming sort of stressor, uh, including some great research on on, uh, women who had very serious cancer, breast cancer, I mean, by a woman named Shelley Taylor. And what that research would show is that that some of the women who coped with it um, best, they find something in their life, like finishing a project, um, finishing a book in one case, something that they could have control over in their life so they just didn't feel helpless. So uh, can we maybe get into a, a few of the nuances of these principles as well, Bob? Uh, you sure. Know, in, uh, so uh, where would you like to begin? Well, let's, let's start with uh, my friend and just brilliant scholar, Amy Edmondson. Yeah. I, I think this is kind of a way to wrap up to some. So Amy Edmondson is uh, she's a professor at the Harvard Business School and is famous for her research on psychological safety. There's been, well, there's been... Uh, Going back to her dissertation research, there's been about 30 years of research on this. Um, in fact, Google, uh, a few years back, did a large-scale study of what the hallmark of what effective groups and teams were. And they were teams where people felt psychologically safe. They felt um, as if it was safe to express concerns, identify problems, and so on. And, and essentially, as a leader, if, if you want to, rather than sort of sweeping the bad news under the rug, um, it's your responsibility if you want effectiveness and uh, to essentially use this, uh, rely on this worse before better effect. So you've got to tell the ugly truths and you need to be safe when people tell you the other uh, truths. And as the quote from Amy says, if you don't get the data about what's wrong, how can you possibly fix it? 
Right. And, and so, one thing I would I would add about this is that, you know, Amy talks about this and she has all sorts of research that shows that when people don't feel psychologically safe, things go wrong. And mm-hmm. the best people also leave organizations. Mm-hmm. But it, as a leader, you've really got to be careful because there's a whole bunch of research that shows that when people deliver bad news to you and criticize you, your first reaction is to not like them. So one of the one of the, the signals I use is that if you've got an employee or a customer who tells you something and you get mad, take that as something that you might actually try to use and get past your anger. So that to me, that's one of the first conditions. And, and, and in the kind of messy situation we're in right now, it, if 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 people aren't giving you a lot of bad news as a leader right now, that's a sign to me, and you're not giving them a lot of bad news. That's a sign to me that you're living in a culture of denial and fear. Ah, so talk to me about safety, because when we begin, we said that crises on the one hand constitute threat, and right. on the other, they represent opportunity, opportunity to reimagine the enterprise, reimagine the team, and so forth. Uh, what I heard you say earlier about safety was psychological safety was very essential to buffer you from feelings of being threatened and tunnel vision. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about how safety is essential to ask questions and really reimagine the enterprise? Well, we're going to talk about innovation a little bit later, but but if people don't feel safe to try new things, to experiment, mm. then it, that and, and what we'll talk about some of the reaction to COVID, I, I, I would almost divide the organizations I'm looking at, and there's old research by a, a, a retired friend of ours, Alan Meyer from University of Oregon, yeah. and what he shows, and it's actually a study of hospital strikes in the, in the San Francisco Bay Area, is essentially half the hospitals, when the strike hit, they just hunkered down and froze, and they, and they didn't do anything except for sort of, it, they, they viewed it as a threat, they were afraid to do anything, but in the hospitals that viewed it as an opportunity, to do things they always wanted to do but never could do before, mm. those were the ones that actually uh, enhanced their capability over a long period of time. So, and certainly we are now facing a combination of threat and opportunity, but if you only um, frame it as a threat and only mm. talk about all the terrible things that are gonna happen and don't focus on, as uh, one of our friends, Carl Liebert, an executive says, playing offense, not just defense, I think that you're making a mistake for a whole bunch of reasons. Wonderful, wonderful. Now, do people scrutinize and pay attention to leaders even more during crises as Uh, opposed to periods of tranquility? Okay, so so, so our friend, Jeff Effer, uh, he just wrote a piece yesterday. We're just talking about it um, when we were warming up that, that essentially he said that good management is even more important now than it is during uh, easier times. And, and this is a classic example. There's all sorts of evidence that, that um, when people are actually animals are in positions of power, uh, that attention is directed up the hierarchy. So when you're a boss, people watch you more closely um, than you are watching them. And, it, 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 and it's just because, it, you think about it, it's adaptive because you know the people or creatures up the hierarchy, they have more power over you. So I got the picture of the baboon here because there's evidence that when you look at uh, baboon troops, like our, our colleague Robert Sapolsky studies baboons, that uh, that the average member of the troop looks up at the alpha male every 20 or 30 seconds to see what's going on. And and uh, I've got a little story, one of my favorite stories. Back at the last meltdown, 2009, I did a bunch of stuff on being a good boss in a bad economy. So I'm talking to a group of executives about it's kind of that prediction, understanding, control stuff. And this guy walks up to me afterwards, and he said, let me tell you an interesting shoes story. And what happened was, uh, so, so the executive vice president is wandering around the office, and, and, and an executive assistant walks up to him and says, so when are the layoffs coming? And the guy just looked shocked, and he said, layoffs? We haven't announced any layoffs. In fact, they had made a layoff decision and not told anyone, and it was very carefully protected. But the reason they figured out that layoffs were coming was that um, he had a tell, sort of like poker. When he was under stress or upset, he would look at his shoes rather than look people in, in the eyes. And so she said to him, it's an interesting shoes day for you, so we know something's wrong. And you think about that story, essentially everybody in the office knew that he had that tell except for him. And to me, that's just you know one element of that, of that uh, 
when you're in a position of authority and it's uh, tough times, because people are afraid, they're watching your every move, your tone of voice, even closer than they usually do. And that's actually rational behavior on their part. But as right. a boss, oh, you got to be so careful about not to accidentally say the wrong thing. Uh, your tone of voice can really have an effect. So, uh, so that's kind of the this notion of uh, of, uh, of attention and the amount that people are scrutinizing you. That gets even worse if you're a boss during tough times. Wonderful. So, you, you know, if you're a boss, you're of course subject to public gaze. They're constantly looking at you. But yes. let's actually tease out a couple of nuances with respect to understanding. Uh, the, the, what I'm trying to wrap in my head is, in an organization uh, of a couple of thousand people, they may be all at different psychological places. Uh, How do I make sense of like where they are? Because one size for sure doesn't fit all, would it? Well, that's a, that's a great. But in, in fact, I, I I'm learning this um, in part. So, so my wife is CEO of a nonprofit to call her out. She's CEO of the uh, Girl Scouts of Northern California. And so far, they're holding together pretty well. But one thing that she's kind of figured out, it, 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 and this is something that you can see way back, but I'm seeing it literally happening in the other room in my house, is, is that when you're kind of in a decision-making role, so, okay, so you analyze the bad news, you kind of go through it, and then, and then you kind of decide what you're going to do. In her case, it's canceling some of the summer camps for, for the girls. Um, but one thing that, that she sort of realized, so I sort of like, is, is people are in different emotional and psychological stages, and she's using the Kubler-Ross analogy. And if you use the Kubler-Ross, it's, it's the reaction that people have, have to death. First, there's denial, then there's anger, then there's bargaining, and there's acceptance. Well, if you're the executive, and you're in the acceptance mode about some difficult decision, but you're dealing with people who are in denial or bargaining or anger, and, and I don't know whether this exactly applies scientifically that um, model, but the notion that, that you've kind of got to bring people along, you've got to be patient with their emotions, you've got to kind of repeat stuff over and over again, that's the kind of stuff that you need to do. And, and so that's one of those things that entails having some empathy um, for, for the folks there. So, that, so that's what I sort of um, think about when it comes to that. That's, uh, you know, and are there things, can you ask people, hey, where are you in this sequence or? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so in fact, what she's doing, she's specifically at asking people and even, I think she even did a poll on, uh, with, with, uh, with some of her employees to ask them where they were at on the, on the um, cycle. So, yeah, you can, you can do that. But also, uh, sometimes if people don't feel quite so psychological safe, uh, safe sort of assuming like, like they're dumb. Why don't they get it? Can't they see right. how speed up things are or something? Right. That, that sort of understanding that it takes us all a while to work through things emotionally. And of course, there's individual differences. There's some people who are going to be slower and there's some people who are going to be faster. And they, and they might not be meaning to be obstinate, obstinate or difficult. It's just they're human beings. And we all sort of uh, respond in different ways. Right. Now, I, I want to take you to uh, perhaps another nuance. And the nuance is, as you've been you know, mentioning, uh, crises like COVID, they create doubt. Oh. How do you go from doubt to confidence? Okay, or so you got doubt an entirely here. bad thing? Uh, so so uh, this is something that Huggy and I talk about constantly. Is 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 the is that to be a great leader, uh, essentially you're always balancing for making the best decisions and implementing implementing the best decisions, um, being certain and being doubtful. So people do want to um, follow confident leaders, and also decisions that are clearly implemented um, are easier to implement because oh we've got to do this. But at the same time, it, if you have what uh, futurists call strong opinions, strongly held. If you say, this is what we're going to do, and we're absolutely going to do it, and you refuse to, in your own mind, think that it might be wrong, or to invite people and say, well, th this might be the wrong decision, then you're not going to be able to update. So it's this combination of starting with a fairly strong point of view, and this is back to predictability, this is what we're all going to do now until it's proven wrong. And it just is an example. It's not a layoff example. So just just a, a final point that I think is worth sort of focusing on, and, and we talked about it some before we go to we go to Q and A, is, is this notion that um, that um, being in a time of crisis, it's it's not just a threat; it's an opportunity. 
And so that's why I've got kind of this stupid hats that um, that's one of my favorite slides that there's all, all these things in organizations that um, essentially we do every day sort of mindlessly and we don't think about them. And, and one advantage of crises is it starts making us think about, well, what are we doing that, um, that gets in the way? Uh, maybe it used to be great. What are we doing sort of over and over again? Maybe we should stop doing. And, yeah. and, and one of the hallmarks that we're seeing, and it's really interesting, and so if we can move to the next slide, slide 20, since I don't think that I have uh, power over this. Um, one of the things that, that we are seeing um, in a lot of the organizations, which is the good news part of it, is they're being so flexible, so imaginative. And, and Huggy and I, we, we study organizational friction that, that we can't believe what's happening. And just to give you one little example, and then we can have Huggy jump in and we can start talking about some of the questions. But one of the things that's really striking is, is uh, things are happening so much faster than ever seen possible. And I'll just give you one example that um, there's a guy named Patrick Collision. He's um, CEO of, um, of a company called Stripe, sort of a pace company, but he's really into how do we do things faster? And he'll, he'll say things like, we built the Golden Gate Bridge in a year and a half. How do we do something like that again now? It would take forever. And so he and some other rich folks, including Reed Hoffman, the billionaire Reed Hoffman, just last week, they put out a call to academics for um, grants um, to do research on COVID. And just last week, and they promised people a 48-hour turnaround. And if you know anything about grants in academia, it takes years. It takes months to just get them through the university administration. It takes six months to evaluate them. And it takes another six months to get the money in. Well, that was last week. This week, you can look it up. They've they had four thousand people apply for grants. They've um, they've awarded forty of them, and the money's been sent to the universities. How the heck is this possible? But I think the reason it's possible is that um, during crisis, sometimes permission is given for us to do things faster and in different ways than possible. So so while I don't want to be all flowers and roses and everything's wonderful, um, I would encourage those of you who are in leadership positions to look at things, well, what are things that we've always, that have been so hard to do here that we could now do faster? So Huggy, uh -huh. I wonder if you have any riff on that, but but that that's really an important point because if we don't learn how to do something from this, it would really be a shame. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with you, Bob, about the opportunity for innovation, if I can be very quick and fast. I think here, the most important uh, emotional foundation for innovation is not to sell a product to somebody, but to help somebody. Yes. And when you have the urge to help, I think you make a big difference. Uh, let me give you a simple example. Uh, some weeks ago, I was actually attending a conference with uh, a company that sells spectacles, and you know they were coming out with a variety of, uh, how shall I put it, frames in different colors and so forth. And uh, what I... I realized was, uh, you know, when they were showing all these spectacles in multiple colors, I was asking the CEO of the company, where is your help muscle? Who needs these? And he says, Professor Rao, what do you mean by that? And I said, here are your executives. Ask them how many of them have elderly parents. A whole bunch of people actually shot their hands up. I said, what's frustrating for you with your parents? Isn't it frustrating when your parents go and visit a physician? They can't remember what the physician said. Wouldn't it be nice to have a version of Google Glass where the elderly parent goes there, they can record the conversation according to HIPAA. As soon as the meeting with the doctor is over, it's uploaded to their children. You've now helped people. So it's not selling a different color of the spectacle, but actually seeing that as a source of help, making life convenient, making life a lot more easy. That's kind of what I wanted to emphasize. Well, you know, I, and I would also add before we go to questions, uh, there, there's research on this, and I think a lot of it can feel it in ourselves, that it's such a difficult time. Um, and um, and when we we try to focus on well what can I do during this difficult time to help others right. rather than to feel sorry for myself, um, it not only actually leads to others being helped, it, it actually um, it helps our own mental health as well as well. So that's something where both innovation and mental health are aligned, if you will. Very well said. Let's actually turn to the question uh, questions. Uh, Mona, you said there were a couple of hundred. 
Oh yes. my God. You have a couple hundred questions piled up. And again, you know, I, my apologies if we're not able to address all of them, but I will, um, and our team will kind of go through um, most of the questions and kind of pick out a few that are very, very kind of representative of, of what a lot of people are asking. And before we get started, Bob and Huggy, I do want to let you know that we have um, participants and audiences from over 110 countries registered. Oh my God. Our wow, today. humbled. Welcome. We, we, we are humbled and grateful to their time and attention. Great. That's yeah. Great. So um, related to that, you know, the first question um, that I feel like would be relevant for a lot of you folks, um, especially if you work for a multinational company or if you have, um, you know, a team that is dispersed across the world. So in this case, um, this particular audience member, they asked, you know, I'm normally the dean of a cooperative between a U.S. and a Chinese university. Leading while I was in China um, was a bit of a challenge. And now I'll trying to lead virtually when I'm physically not there makes this situation even more challenging. So, um, you know, in, in, in situations like these, do you have any recommendations or suggestions as to how leaders can lead effectively, not only across cultures, but also in the way where, you know, they can kind of um, leverage technology or anything else, um, you know, around them to lead effectively when they're physically not there? That's a, a great question. Bob, do you want me to take this question? Yeah, why don't you take this one? Sure. So my this is a great question. Uh, how can you be effective as a leader when you're physically remote? My short answer to the questioner is, you should really think of establishing very simple but powerful protocols to coordinate work better. So let me give you an example. So suppose you're in the leader of your team and your team members are in five different countries or 10 different countries and so forth. If that's happening and it's a new team, the simple way to begin the first team meeting is ask each one to actually take a minute or two to share the worst team experience they've ever <laughs> been part of. And the moment they've shared with you the biggest clusterfuck they've been part of, <laughs> instantly you know I understand where they're all emotionally. This is so-and-so's hot button. That's another hot button. And then you can actually be much more effective. It's, so simple things like that can help a lot. So, so uh, building off of what Hagi is saying, so a, a class that I taught last term worked, it was, it was supposed to be in theory with our human resource management executives at Stanford. And, it, and, and they work a lot on Zoom and other online platforms. And, and, and they came up with some rituals to help to help sort of deal with the lack of, uh, of emotional connection that you have in, in technologies like these. And little things like, well, what's the best thing you ate in the last week? So you'd sort of yeah. talk about that. Uh, one thing that's happening a lot is people describe their footwear right now, since all of us are working online. And, uh, and uh, nobody can see our feet. So right now I'm wearing the same uh, blue socks that I usually wear. And other people wear slippers, and, and hardly anybody wear, seems to wear shoes anymore. Uh, so, so those sort of things that that sort of create a bond and an emotional connection can be useful. And 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 then the the other thing that I would say, and I've got colleagues, including my colleague Pamela Hines from uh, from my department, Management Science and Engineering. She studies online behavior, and the thing that she really emphasizes, which is tough now, but. Um, online um, collaborations between people who even get to spend one day together once are enormously better. So anything yeah. that you can do, so hopefully, you know, when the COVID crisis um, eases, to have some face-to-face -face, um, stuff uh, woven into the online experiences makes them enormously better. Yeah, so uh, very quickly, uh, before we move on to the next question, the other thought that crossed my mind is, to the questioner, the reason when you're doing remote work, you have to emphasize coordination is most people attribute poor team performance to problems of cooperation rather than coordination. Why aren't we doing things well together? Well, Bob's dragging his feet, and Bob will say, Huggy is dragging his feet. And we can go do that, but the real problem is coordination. That's what you shouldn't lose sight of. Next question, please. Great. So the next question, again, might be relevant for a lot of folks here is that, you know, 
when, when you guys discuss kind of the principles that you introduced initially in, in our conversation today, um, are those applicable to middle management? And you know, how would they kind of change or adapt um, to, to, to leaders or managers who are in that position where they're not necessarily decision makers, but also in charge of leading a team or a group? Yeah. Do you um, want to take this, Bob? Yeah, let's, I'll start with that. So you know, middle managers, most managers are middle managers. There's only a few at the top. And you know the, the classic line in the organizational literature is, is middle managers, especially first line supervisors, are masters and victims of double talk. And so, so as a lead, as a middle manager, it's just, if you have even one person reporting to you, part of your job is to do what you can to um, to buffer them from the craziness of, above. I describe this as serving as, as a human shield, and and sometimes what that means is pushing back on senior management to say to them, well, you're predictable for my people. And sometimes, you know, and I hate to say this, but if you've got a lousy boss who doesn't um, create any predictability or understanding or control, do what you can in your sphere, of, your, your sphere of influence to create a little plan to enable the people who work for you to move for and yourself to move forward with some predictability. So to me, it's a combination of shielding and any place that you think that you have some control, including may become some what I call constructive defiance, because um, there's a lot of times when uh, w w and our late colleague, Jim Smart, talks about this. Some of the things that the great leaders do is they ignore instructions and do the right thing. And sometimes that's your responsibility. And of course, if you're going to get yourself fired, it might be too extreme, but taking some um, initiative yourself sometimes is quite helpful. And by the way, when things turn out well, if you've got a, a smart but incompetent boss, he or she might take credit for you doing the right thing. Very well said, Bob. The only other thing I would add is, and I think uh, the most important thing for middle managers is you have to do something. Being inactive and waiting for Godot is not going to be helpful. Groucho Marx put it brilliantly. As he said, if you do nothing, there's a problem. You don't know when you're finished. That's great. I, I thought I'd leave on a, I'd, I'd respond with that mischievous line. Next question, Mona. Perfect. So um, another question that, that you know some folks have asked is, to what extent you know is a good boss or bad boss simply determined by their temperament, and and how how can you deal with someone who just has a bad temperament? You know, someone who might. <laughs> someone who who might be crass you know how, how do you how do you work with folks like that and, uh, and... Uh, Bob I think this is really in your baby oh god so, so I did write at least two books on workplace assholes and about thank you 80 or 90 percent of the emails I got about which is about 10,000 emails now are about asshole bosses so so uh, essentially when when you have a nasty boss um, you kind of got three basic options. I mean, there's there's thousands of options, but in the end, you've got three choices. One is you can fight back. And I'm a big believer in fighting back if you can figure out how to win. <laughs> That's right. So, so that means you document, you do your political work, um, but be very wary about fighting back when you don't have the power to fight back. Right. The second thing is quit. Uh, it's a little tougher. Well, it's a lot tougher given the current situation that we're in. Uh, but if, if you leave and, and anybody I've ever met who quit an asshole boss, they, nobody has ever said, gee, I should have waited longer. I've never met a single person who says that. So is quitting. And the, and the thing that unfortunately a lot of us now with job security being more um, difficult is essentially finding ways. And this is the domain of cognitive behavioral therapy to have it essentially do less torture to your soul. So this is every, everything from, Avoiding as much contact with him or her as possible. Uh, one of my favorite ones, I, I better not use her name, one of my colleagues, she had an asshole dissertation advisor <laughs> who would write her these long, nasty emails. And what she would do is she would answer them every two weeks. So that was the way she it was like limiting exposure to a toxic substance. Um, and other things you can do, it's more in the domain of reframing it, is view it as a joke, view it as temporary. Um, if, if you've ever been to a kind of behavioral therapist, you kind of know what I'm talking about. It's, it, tell yourself it's, it's not your fault because it, it probably isn't. 
So to me, those are the three basic buttons. Get out, fight back, but be careful if you're going to fight, be in a position you can win. If not, find ways to make yourself um, um, more emotionally tougher to, and reduce sort of like a toxic substance like kryptonite, reduce your um, exposure to it. So that, those Very are kind well of my said. big three. Yeah, th those are uh, very practical pieces of advice. Uh, the one thing I'd uh, briefly sort of add to that is we all have many selves within us. Uh, you know, one could be a nasty self, uh, the other could be a much more positive self and so on. So even the boss who's, if you will, an asshole, that yeah. person too, he or she, can have a better self in them. And so you're one of the things that you that might actually help you is try and get the boss touch, in touch, not with the fears that evokes the worst temperament, yeah. but actually with the better part of themselves. Yeah, so, 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 so that's, great. that's yeah. excellent, Hagi. Keep going, I'm sorry. Yeah, so the only thing I would sort of say is, the way I'd actually deal with a boss like this is through something that's been called the best self technique or manipulation. And the thing to do is to go to the boss and say, hey, boss, can you, why don't you tell us about a time when you felt you were at your very best? You know, where you were firing on all cylinders. You were accomplishing a lot. Talk to us a little bit about that. And I think the more you get the boss to talk to, a, to talk to this particular dimension of themselves, chances are the more likely is that going to be activated. I, and, and I would also add, and so we're sort of in the domain of the, simply the notion that people are jerks or they're nice people. We're right. much more complicated than that. Right. And, and situations are very powerful. And just thinking about the situation that many of our leaders are in, if you want to create grumpy, nasty people, uh, it's we're in a, when people are sleep deprived, um, right. when they're in a hurry, when they're under time pressure. I, th this is all the stuff that's happening. Oh, and also working online rather than in person is a really reliable way to turn people into sort of nasty um, people because they don't have as much empathy for one another. So having some understanding of the situation that we're all in right now is something that might help all of us. Absolutely. Uh, next question, please. Perfect. So, um, you know, a really important question, um, and, I, and I feel like this also reflects uh, uh, what, what a lot of people are thinking is, how is leading a company or leading a team different if your industry is currently doing really well versus, you know, if you're working for a company or in an industry that's currently getting hit really hard um, by by the, um, the, the, the coronavirus or the situation that we're in? Yeah. That's a really good question. Bob, can I take a stab at it, and yeah, then yeah. Uh, you can add an amen. So the first thing is, uh, let's actually begin by understanding performance. And if you look at performance, we can ask ourselves, to what extent is performance determined by industry structure? To what, is, to what extent is performance determined by your corporate parent? And to what extent is performance really determined by your business capabilities and competences? In one of the more recent studies that has been done, they showed that performance is largely shaped by business level capabilities and competences. I think about 30, 33 or 34%. Uh, if you look at industry structure, it's actually much less, 12 or 13 percent, if I recall rightly. And the effect of the corporate parent is much smaller. The rest, of course, is all in, as they say, the error term of the uh, equation. I think the way to sort of think about it is, you know, you can have a two by two matrix. Tough industry structure and poor performance, or great industry structure and poor performance, or tough industry structure and great performance, great industry structure and bad performance. So you have four quadrants, and the answers for all of them aren't necessarily uh, the same. So even in tough industries, there are great performers. And we can, of course, learn a lesson from them. And what kinds of lessons? Innovation there would consist, I would assume, of copying what they're doing, if you can. 
many of the innovations we live today, a lot of them have their origins someplace else. You look at Toyota's and on cord system where somebody pulls on a cord to stop the production line. Where did that come from? From trains, of course, and buses. That's one modest kind of example. So, but the point is what managers, what's very tempting for managers to do is to blame industry structure for poor performance. And when you do well, you say it's because of your business capabilities. That's too oversimplified an attribution. All bad things aren't due to industry structure. All good things aren't due to you. It's a little more complicated than that. Bob, you want to add, amend, add, come well, to this? Just, as, as a summary, there, there's older studies that show essentially um, when, th when things go badly, uh, that leaders who uh, essentially almost take too much blame and say, I broke, essentially, I broke it, I can fix it. Those are the ones who do better over time. And the ones who say, it's not my fault, those are the ones who tend to lead companies that do less well. And, and, and some of it just has to, has to do with this notion that, um, that when you say, I'm accountable, the buck stops here, uh, people believe that to this point, if you, if you broke it, you can fix it. And then when things go well, you get credit for it. So, so having this, developing this confidence and leadership as part of your job is convincing people that you actually do have some control and maybe even more control than you actually objectively do. Right. Uh, and I realize it's getting to be one. And I, I'd like to, if you will, offer a story in the principle, the principle first. When, when you're doing badly, the most important thing that a leader has is if the people working for the leader can trust the leader. Yes. And, you know, uh, both Bob and I talk about a very, very famous fire called the Man Gulch Fire that our friend and mentor Carl Weick wrote about. And what's interesting about the thing is, imagine you're a group of firemen. You're fighting a fire. You see the fire encroaching. In the case of the Man Gulch Fire, the leader was the one person who said, hey, we can't outrun the fire. Instead, what we should do is we should light a small fire around ourselves so that there's no dry material there for the oncoming fire to, to, to actually ignite. So let's set off a fire. Let's hunker down under our protective sheets. Unfortunately, even though the leader said the right thing, the other team members did not trust him. And what did they do? They started to outrun the fire. But fatally, being firemen, your tools are an extension of yourself. Even though as they were trying to outpace the fire, they forgot to drop their tools. As a result, they tragically were consumed by the fire. And the leader who lit a fire around himself and hunkered down was the only one who survived. Yeah. So on the one hand, what crises like this do is they underscore the importance of trust but they also emphasize the need for you to think about dropping your tools. All right. I think that's a lovely summary. I think well, we're done. Thank so, you so much, I, uh, and Huggy. Um, I was just wondering, before we wrap things up, is there anything else you would, you would like to add? I know we've had a wonderful discussion and, and had so many questions coming in from our audience from, from all over the world. Um, I, I just would like to end by just thanking everybody for, uh, well, for your, uh, attending for your great questions and for your patience. All of us are sort of struggling with these technologies these days. So, so I appreciate all that and, uh, and stay in touch. Huggy and I love hearing from folks with, with ideas, suggestions, criticisms, uh, keep coming at us. We, we love hearing your ideas and, and I'm sure, I'm, I don't know which 20 or 25% of what we said was wrong, but I'm sure that 25% of it was wrong. So help us learn more. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you again, you know, Bob and Huggy for joining us today and, you know, working with us through all of our, our technical difficulties and challenges. And again, you know, especially for leading this very timely and important discussion um, with our audience. So if you found today's presentation helpful, we really encourage you to share the recording with your friends, family, colleagues, team members, or, or whoever else, you know, um, because again, you know, this was a very important discussion and, and I felt like it was very necessary for a lot of us to kind of hear um, and, and learn from how to manage
finish this uh, crisis that we're in. So um, again, thanks uh, to all of you for taking the time to join us today. And we also look forward to seeing you at our mm -hmm. next virtual event in May and more information to come on that. So have a great rest of your day and we'll see all of you soon.